All right. Some folks are still trickling in, but I think in interest of time, we can get started. And uh, I will ask Kathy DeMoto, our board president, to get us started. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Good evening, and thank you for joining us at the Public Health Museum's second event for Public Health Week 2021. My name is Catherine DeMoto, and I'm the president of the Museum's Board of Trustees. In the past, our Public Health Week events have been held at the museum in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, but we have embraced the virtual environment as a result of COVID-19 and are reaching out to a wider audience. Now, those of you who attended yesterday's, uh, last night's um, event, you will have heard uh, most of this before, but I'll just give you a little reminder about the museum. Um, and overall, thanks to um, Ashlyn Rickford Werner for her technical assistance and uh, Paige Impink and Ashlyn for the work they've been doing for our publicity. It's been very successful. For those of you not familiar with the museum, and have not been able to visit, I just want to make, take the opportunity to give you a brief background about America's first public health museum. The museum is a nonprofit organization located on the campus of the Tewksbury Hospital in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, which was founded as a state almshouse in 1854 and has been in continuous operation ever since. The hospital's patient population has evolved reflecting the needs of the Commonwealth, initially treating many immigrants with things like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid fever. Um, and as a last resort, it would also take in patients in need of shelter and supervised care. Currently, care is provided for up to 300 both medical and psychiatric patients. The museum opened in 1994 and is located on the 700 acre state campus in a national historic building, which was built in 1854, sorry, 1894. Um, we have a wide collection of historic public health artifacts and documents that are exhibited in six rooms of the historic building. The exhibits cover a wide collection, such as in the infectious disease, we have things of malaria, smallpox, tuberculosis, and polio. We have things on mental health, nursing and education, dental, and much more. So come visit. The museum's mission is to celebrate the history and achievements of public health and to preserve the past, inspire future practitioners educate the public and advance the future of public health through partnerships with academic institutions. So please visit our website, publichealthmuseum.org for visiting hours. We do have some COVID restrictions and for any new events and our exhibits. This will be our second presentation for this year's Public Health Week. On Friday, please join us for public health trivia. We will have three rounds filled with public health, pop culture, guess what disease, and a picture round. Our top teams will take home great prizes. We are looking forward to future virtual programs and hope you will join us and support the museum. You can book a tour of the museum on the website and stay tuned on our social media and in our newsletter for announcements as to when our campus tours will start this coming season. Now I will turn to Ashlyn Rickford Werner, a museum board member who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. Okay, so I just wanted to start out quickly um, and say that I want to take a quick moment to share that this program is supported in part by a grant from the Tewksbury Cultural Council, a local agency which is supported by the Massachusetts Cultural Council, a state agency. So I just wanted to give a quick thank you to the Cultural Council for your support in this program. 
Um, I also wanted to note quickly that throughout the presentation, you can feel free to drop questions into the chat and we will have time at the end of the lecture for Q&A. So feel free to add those as we go through. Um, and then I wanted to introduce the lovely Laurel Gable. Laurel is a respected scholar in the field of cemetery and gravestone studies, a popular, popular lecturer, author of more than 20 essays and articles, and co-author with Theodore Chase of Gravestone Chronicles 1 and 2, two books about early New England gravestones and the men who carved them. A registered nurse in a previous lifetime, Laurel has been an active member of the Association for Gravestone Studies since 1979, when a lifelong passion for research, genealogy, social history, and folk art came together in a study of New England's early burial grounds. And as a member of the Association for Gravestone Studies as well with Laurel, I can say this is a truly fabulous presentation. So welcome Laurel and I will stop sharing my screen and let you take over. And you, I just asked you to unmute and you should be able to share, uh, share your screen. Okay. Speckled monsters destroying oh, angels. You're not sharing just yet. Oh no. That's okay. I should be sharing. Uh, if you go to the share screen and then um, yeah, I know. select Brian select the item. Hold okay. On. No problem. Okay. Uh -huh. There we go. And then just enter in presentation mode and you are all set. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Speckled monsters make me disappear. Destroying angels and strangling distempers, a plague of epidemics. In the spring of 1721, Boston, Massachusetts had a population of close to 10,000 souls. Over the next year, smallpox infected more than half of them, leaving behind nearly 350 new graves. A well-known and fear disease for many centuries, smallpox, called smallpox to distinguish it from the great pox or syphilis, was considered one of life's inevitable curses, routinely killing 30% of those infected or for those with no previously acquired immunity, as high as 80 or 90%. After Europeans carried smallpox and measles to North America, these illnesses wiped out most of the Native American population in the East. By 1763, for example, the entire Native population of Indian Town in South Yarmouth had died of smallpox. Boston's great smallpox epidemic arrived in April by way of one infected sailor from His Majesty's ship Seahorse and quickly spread throughout the town. Survivors of earlier smallpox outbreaks had acquired resistance to the disease, but the town's population had doubled since then and recent inhabitants had little to no immunity. There was no understanding of the cause of smallpox, of its symptomless 12-day incubation period or its method of transmittal. In the year 1721, Bostonians knew only that the disease was often fatal and that the red quarantine flags asking that God have mercy on this house did not keep death at bay. The graph is based on uh, gravestone data from the five Boston burying grounds. Children not previously exposed to smallpox account for more than one third of the extant gravestones that include an age of death. The customary treatment, barley water, bloodletting, fasting and prayer were no match for the viral contagion of smallpox. In October, during the height of the pandemic, the militia did a house to house canvas of the immediate town and found close to 2,500 inhabitants in the heart of the community ill with the disease, an average of 13 burials each day. 
This unprecedented number of deaths prompted the general court to limit the number of times a church bell could be rung for the dead, to restrict the hours for funerals, and to order an official day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer to appease God and bring relief from the scourge. As the epidemic grew, Cotton Mather, Boston's Puritan religious leader, urged the town fathers to consider a revolutionary new experiment called inoculation, which he had learned from his slave, Onesimus, who had undergone the procedure in Africa. Onesimus described how his skin was opened with a sharp lancet and matter from a smallpox blister was transferred to the small wound, which was then covered with a walnut shell to protect the site. He soon developed a milder case of smallpox and gained lifetime protection from the speckled monster. Mather concluded, quote, inasmuch as the practice of preventing the smallpox by way of an inoculation has never yet been introduced into our nation, I cannot but move that it be warily proceeded in. There was almost universal violent opposition to this. Mather's home was firebombed and the handful of other supporters were harassed, publicly ridiculed and seriously threatened. Boston's only university trained medical doctor at the time, a Scotsman named William Douglas, led the vociferous opposition to inoculation. It was Dr. Zebdiel Boylston, alone among the physicians and the vast majority of townspeople, who stood out as a fervent believer in inoculation's effectiveness. Boylston put his reputation and his life on the line when he demonstrated the procedure by inoculating his own six-year-old son. The majority of Boston's medical practitioners remained adamant against it, denouncing Boylston as a dangerous quack and condemning his inoculations as barbaric and sinful a practice that promoted the heathen contrivances of men over the all-wise providence of God. By the end of the epidemic, 8% of the city's population had died from naturally acquired smallpox. In the same 11-month period, there were only six deaths, or one half of 1% of the population who died as a result of inoculation. Inoculation's first practitioner, Zebdiel Boylston, died at his farm in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1766 at the age of 87 and is buried next to his wife in nearby Walnut Hill Cemetery. I think it's rather sad that someone who had such an important role in medical history lies unacknowledged beneath this broken gravestone. Of the 850 smallpox deaths in 1751, only a single percentage received a permanent gravestone, and only this one gravestone for Jacob Chamberlain included smallpox as a cause of death. In many communities, pox victims were buried outside the confines of an established burying yard, in an open field or in some other isolated area away from the population quarantined in death as in life. The only way we know that Abraham Hill died in the epidemic is that the information is mentioned in local death records and in a family Bible. Church and town records verify that Samuel Scarborough also died of the smallpox, although like the majority of other epidemic fatalities, the gravestone offers no such confirmation. The stones for Jonathan Colton and Phineas Stebbins, I'm sorry, Phineas Spellman, record smallpox as the cause of death. Oh, here you see it here and here. As does the gravestone that Carver George Allen Jr. made for Joseph Torrey's grave in Menden, Massachusetts. The stone for 17-year-old Louis Stebbins laments his untimely death from the inoculation administered to protect his life. Young Peleg Conklin succumbed to a similar fate. 
The unpredictability of inoculation outcomes was not remedied until the more controlled process of vaccination was introduced by Edward Jenner in 1796. As a result of vaccination, the World Health Organization reports no evidence of naturally occurring smallpox transmission anywhere in the world today. Diphtheria, also known as throat distemper, the strangling death, putrid sore throat, cankerous fever, or fatal distemper, was another much feared killer, particularly of children. Dr. Ernest Caulfield, a pedi pediatrician and well-respected gravestone scholar, authored what is still regarded as one of the finest examples of medical research and historical reporting when he traced the path of diphtheria and scarlet fever throughout colonial New England. He did this by following the evidence he found in burying grounds. Caulfield's history of the terrible epidemic, vulgarly called the throat distemper, remains the authoritative study on this epidemic killer. In Kingston, New Hampshire, where Caulfield believed the epidemic began in 1735, throat distemper caused the death of 102 children over a period of a few weeks. It was not unusual for siblings who often died within hours of each other to be buried together in a single grave or next to each other. More than three quarters of diphtheria deaths were for children under the age of 10. As with most epidemic killers, there was little initial understanding of the cause or the method of transmittal of this diphtheria. It was at the time a mysterious and perplexing disease that because it was popped up explosively in many unconnected and distant areas of town, it was not thought to be spread by contact. In other words, it was not contagious. The town's ministers and physicians were in constant contact with the afflicted families, traipsing between one sick house and another and undoubtedly spreading the disease but their limited understanding of contagion never suggested the need to quarantine, and they undoubtedly spread death everywhere they went. And in a time when most unexplained tragedies received a religious interpretation, many could explain the staggeringly high mortality rate only as proof of the woeful effects of original sin or as one minister put it, the fruit of some other unknown transgression. As the epidemic jumped from farm to farm and then town to town, it greatly diminished an entire generation of young people. Some families lost six or seven children in the space of one week, leaving the bereaved parents childless. Diphtheria arrived in Haverhill, Massachusetts at the end of 1735 and raged violently for the next two years, according to accounting for more than 250 deaths, almost all of them children. As the epidemic moved to other towns, the same tragic events were repeated again and again. These beautifully carved stones in Cambridge, Massachusetts were produced by the Lampson shop for some who had died in the month of June. The first effective diphtheria vaccine was produced shortly after Bruna Santi's death from diphtheria in 1918. However, it was not widely used until the 1930s when diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccines were combined as the very effective DPT vaccination. In the past decade, there were less than five reported cases of diphtheria in the United States. When symptoms of the rampant epidemic first appeared in Boston, doctors there took immediate action. They formed the country's first medical society in 1735 and legislated strict quarantines. Boston physicians blamed the frighteningly high rate of epidemic deaths outside the city on poorly educated and uninformed country doctors. In contrast, 
Boston physicians believed that their superior scientific treatment methods were the reason for noticeably milder cases, quicker recoveries, and a negligible, a negligible death rate. True, in Boston's outbreak, children did seem to suffer with less virulent fevers, milder rashes, and none of the strangling symptoms that killed others so quickly. But at the time, scarlet fever, measles, diphtheria, and sometimes smallpox were considered simply as different manifestations of the same disease. It was the pediatrician and gravestone scholar, Ernest Caulfield, again, who found that the epidemic that visited Boston and puffed up its medical community was not diphtheria. Boston's epidemic was actually a milder form of scarlet fever which is caused by a group A streptococcus, the same bacteria responsible for strep throat. Scarlet fever was the 19th century's deadliest communicable disease, prompting newly formed boards of health to enforce strict quarantines. Yarmouth, which is where I reside, saw repeated waves of scarlet fever and many deaths throughout the 1800s. By 1840, scarlet fever or canker rash had become the leading cause of death among the infectious diseases of childhood. A major outbreak occurred in Massachusetts in 1857, spread rapidly and eventually accounted for more than 2000 deaths. The magnitude of scarlet fever's impact lies hidden away in death records, obituaries, and in Marjorie Williams' story of the Velveteen Rabbit, but rarely, almost never, on gravestones. Scarlet fever continued to be an epidemic risk until the 1940s, when penicillin helped eradicate it as the number one childhood killer. It is no longer even a reportable disease in the United States. Still considered the mother of all pandemics, the explosive influenza epidemic of 1918 and 19 killed more people than any other disease outbreak in human history, more than the plague or smallpox or AIDS, more than 10 times the number who died in World War I. Influenza was also known as the Spanish flu, in part because Spain, a neutral nation in the Great War, was the one country to actually acknowledge the epidemic reality of the disease. In the US, the Great War took precedent and having la grippe was not taken very seriously until it was much too late. Almost half the Earth's population became infected and an estimated 50 million people died. During the course of the epidemic, the average US lifespan plummeted by 12 years. It came when the world was weary of war. It swept a globe in months. It went away as mysteriously as it appeared. And when it was over, humanity had been struck by a disease that killed more people in a few months than any other illness in the history of the world. It was the defining epidemic of the 20th century. It seemed benign at first. No one considered the flu to be a serious illness, certainly nothing that needed to be reported, until March 4th, 1918, when otherwise healthy young soldiers at Camp Funston in Kansas began overrunning the base infirmary with frightening flu-like symptoms that within hours led to strange mahogany colored skin, violent hemorrhaging, difficulty breathing and rapid death by suffocation. More than 1100 soldiers were soon admitted to the hastily thrown together base hospital. No one had ever seen anything like this disease. America newly immersed in the great war was frantically mobilizing on every front. Soldiers from Camp Funston were being shipped to different army bases all over the country, as well as to war fronts in Europe, spreading the new disease at an alarming rate. At Fort Devens in Massachusetts, 
Medics wrote about young recruits dying like flies, averaging more than 100 deaths each day. Their bodies stacked like cordwood in every available space of the overcrowded infirmary. Other army camps in many US cities began reporting excessive mortality from a frighteningly lethal form of la grippe. The mobilizing military units increased train and ship travel, growing wartime commerce, and the many patriotic and public events helped spread the virus to every corner of the nation and the world. And it was just proportionately affecting those in the very prime of life. Initially, there was a concerted effort to downplay the obvious seriousness of the epidemic. Such alarming information was seen as detrimental to the war effort and bad for national morale. Official public messages were transmitted in code to avoid any national panic and to ensure that details of the epidemic were unknown to the German enemy. All things German were already under suspicion. Bach and Beethoven were removed from concert programs. Schools stopped teaching German and soon there were rumors that the strange lethal flu and germ was germ warfare. Eventually, the magnitude of the influenza danger was impossible to hide. People were dying at a really terrifying rate, but without any idea of the pathology, public health measures were the only defense. There was no real knowledge of viruses at the time no way to deal with the unknown causes of the illness. Posters could only stress the importance of common health measures. Home remedies became part of the daily defense. How to avoid influenza? Don't spit. Gargle daily and wear the required mask. Although unknown to anyone at the time, the masks, which were a mandated defense against the flu, did not offer enough protection against the still to be discovered virus, which would become visible only through a yet to be invented electron microscope in 1931. The altered focus of an old nursery verse became popular as a jump rope rhyme. I had a little bird and its name was Enza. I opened up the window and in flew Enza. If you're old enough to remember these jump rope drills, this is where one jumper exits and the new one comes in. By the fall of 1918, the influenza death rate reached its peak in the United States. In large cities, infected bodies were required to be placed on a porch, in the yard or an alley, for patrolling corpse wagons to remove. There was haste, panic, lack of accountability, and more bodies than could be processed. Haste and fear won out over any normal accountability. Mass graves were a sudden public health necessity. Countless bodies were unidentified, but all needed to be buried as quickly and hastily as hastily dug trenches could swallow them. There were not enough doctors to confirm or record deaths, not enough coffins, grave diggers, burial spaces, or accountability of any kind. Few bodies were embalmed and many families never knew the location of a loved one's grave. Particular respect was paid to doctors, nurses, and citizen volunteers whose selfless efforts to aid the sick resulted in their own untimely deaths. Mary Louise Hedell was one of several women to receive the Navy Cross following her death from influenza while serving as the Navy Peace Corps. But perhaps the saddest monuments mark mass graves for the many unnamed dead. Immigrant workers in the limestone and other local industries buried in a cemetery with one to five bodies in each grave. The final resting place of many of the men and women and children of Auckland who died as a result of New Zealand's worst epidemic. The epidemic passed through New York City in the autumn of 1918. The area near this stone served as an unmarked common grave for scores of victims. 
in remembrance of the children buried in this area who died in the epidemic of 1918, whose names are known only to God. There are literally millions of faceless and forgotten victims of this catastrophic killer. Yet influenza is rarely mentioned as a cause of death on a gravestone. Perhaps some of you are old enough, as am I, to remember the 20th century polio epidemic. Infantile paralysis, another highly infectious viral disease, was the most serious communicable disease in the nation during the 1950s. Pools and theaters closed, Sunday school classes, birthday parties, skating rinks, and any other activities that attracted children were all avoided. Many lives were regulated by the fear of polio, which infected more than 60,000 children in, 18, in 1952. Hospitals added huge iron lung units to care for polio victims whose breathing muscles were paralyzed by the virus. As an aside, when I began nurses training in the mid 1950s, iron lung wards such as these were still very common in most large city hospitals. Although there is nothing on their gravestones to indicate it, these children all died from polio. I have not located even one grave marker with a reference to the disease. It was Franklin D. Roosevelt, himself an adult victim of the disease, who put polio awareness in the news. Roosevelt helped found the March of Dimes in 1938, but it was two scientists, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, who eventually conquered polio with the Salk vaccine in 1955 and the Sabin oral vaccine introduced in 1962. Thanks to these vaccines, the global occurrence of polio has declined by more than 99%. America was declared polio free in 1994. As has been true with AIDS, and Ebola. And now COVID-19, our present scourge. Epidemics become historic when the sheer magnitude of their disruption affects an entire society and precipitates giant cultural shifts. Death from epidemic smallpox, diphtheria, influenza, or polio is rarely acknowledged on the grave of a victim. It appears that although the epidemic itself is historic and individual deaths are so common as to be unnoteworthy and individual memorials seldom record the cause of death. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laurel. So I wanted to open, it's up to questions. I'll give folks a few minutes to enter some questions into the chat feature and give folks a minute there. And I do have a question <laughs> for Laurel, but I'll let folks um, take a few seconds to, to pose their questions first. Me back here. Okay, so as folks are posting questions, um, I wanted to ask a question for Laurel. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, COVID nineteen and on, obviously on everyone the top of everyone's minds continually over the last <laughs> over over a year now. Um, going forward, do you suspect that there will be? Um, areas dedicated to COVID-19 victims or memorials placed down the line at some point for victims of COVID-19 pandemic? I can't predict any more than I could predict that all these um, burials were unmarked, but I do think that we're in an age of more individualism. And I think that more people might mention this on their grave marker or their families would mention it on their grave marker. Um, 
I'm not sure about any section set aside for, for COVID victims. I don't see that happening because they're so scattered and so um, they're just from every, every section, every walk of life. So there might be, if the cemetery is burying, um, is, is, has open areas and they're burying in, in the way that they get uh, bodies, that's possible that there will be a whole section. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and potentially, right. there you go, we can see you. Um, especially, um, you know, in city cemeteries or mass burial sites, it's obviously New York um, as it struggled with it in 1918, they did it in, in 20, in this pandemic as well. So um, we do yes, I, I do think that there'll be more mention of COVID on grave markers than there have been in, in the other epidemics. Absolutely. Is it common to note non-infectious causes of death on gravestones? Question from Amanda. Uh, it's more common, I think. Uh, if, if it's an unusual death, it's usually noted. If it's, um, you know, somebody was struck by lightning or drowned or lost at sea, um, you will see those mentioned more frequently. Uh, it's not that smallpox is never mentioned, it's just that it's rarely mentioned and it was such a killer. So it's a very tiny percentage that even has that on a stone. Absolutely. There's been many yellow fever as well, especially in uh, historic New England. Um, great. Are there any symbols on stones that were used to indicate a cause of death instead of just the name of the disease? I'm not sure I heard that. Are there any symbols? Yeah, were there any symbols that were used to indicate a cause of death instead of just the name? So instead of saying just smallpox, was there a symbol to uh, indicate very, infectious? You, they would be unique if they were at all. But um, there are there are a few rare examples that are, you know, that we always point to. And it's if somebody chopped their leg off, there might be a leg with an axe, and it's in two parts and you sort of get the picture, but um, I can't think of any real common or, I can't think of any common symbols for cause of death um, specifically. Yeah. yeah. Are there any pictures or timeline on display at the Public Health Museum? Um, that's from Susan. Um, are, Susan, are you referring specifically to like Infectious diseases timeline. That's maybe a follow-up question that you can post in the chat. Um, we do cover uh, in the Public Health Museum in our infectious disease exhibit. We cover many of the infectious disease Laurel has talked about today. So it uh, really bodes <laughs> bodes well. Um, if you have not visited the Public Health Museum, um, you can learn more uh, in in the museum as well. This lecture content specifically, we do not, um, but this will be actually available online after the fact. And it was another question, so if folks want to go back and reference, uh, and maybe we'll have a we'll include something about this in the museum in the future. So, and then, okay, let's see. There's plenty of other questions here. What happened to the mass graves from the 1918 flu pandemic? Were they gener generally maintained as such, obscured, or were bodies reinterred? Um, I probably can't give an authoritative answer on that because I don't know. I don't know of any that were reinterred because so many were unidentified. They were, they were literally picked up off the streets or on the front lawns and um, identities were lost. And I, I don't know of any mass grave that's been celebrated enough to be saved. So I don't know the answer. I know in city cemeteries as well that, you know, there was rules uh, in the cemetery I worked at. There was rules that we, you know, we, if it was a mass grave, um, right. unidentified folks, you could never remove it. So even if one day down the line, yeah. a loved one figured out that that was where their yeah. great grandfather was, they couldn't remove it. Yeah, there are areas in within cemeteries where they are a mass grave and there's a mass monument and it just says here are the un, 
uh, unidentified bodies or, or not even using that term, but here are bodies who died, people who died in the, um, the great epidemic, um, but there's no further individual information and those will not be disturbed. But there are other areas that have been disturbed and they're just, you know, people now are doing the research and finding that, well, there were 14 people buried there. So we'll put up a monument, but there's, there's no idea of exactly where. Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome from Japan, someone who posted here. Um, and the other, feel free if there's any other questions um, to drop those in the chat right now. Um, but I do wanna note as well, thank you Paige for pointing that out. We um, do have our pandemics timeline um, on the Public Health Museum's website. It's not specifically related to gravestones, but there is the public, um, the pandemics timeline that you can reference as well. Um, in the presentation, there was a picture of a cat with a mask. Did people also believe pets could catch or spread smallpox or the flu or whatnot back then? Um, kind of like people fear that their pets could spread coronavirus. I, I think that the big issue was that they just had no idea where this was coming from. And if everybody was mandated, mandated in the family to wear a mask, then for the picture, I think they put a mask on the cat. Um, I have no idea what they thought um, because everybody thought something different because nobody really knew. And it's just, there's the same problem that they had then that we're seeing now. There were people who were not going to wear a mask there were a couple of well-known shootings. Um, somebody demanding that you wear a mask to get on the trolley and someone saying, I'm not. And so there, there was contention about this, but um, they really had no idea what was, you know, what was causing this. Germs were one thing, but they didn't really have a, much about viruses at the time. Absolutely. I don't know what they thought. I thought the mask was cute though, so that's why I put it in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. Steve Steve noted here that Kingston, New Hampshire has a smallpox road in town. The story goes that family belongings would be collected in a wagon, carted off to a section of town and burned. Very interesting. Wow. Very interesting. Thank you for yeah. that information. Yeah. Did anyone else have any other questions they would like to pose to the wonderful Laurel? Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for giving up an hour. And I'm glad it was for the museum because they do a good job. And I was so, I was so, um, I don't know, nostalgic isn't the right word, but to see your iron lung. Yes. Um, because when I went first as a nursing student, I was taken to City Hospital um, to see the iron lungs with people in them. And it's, stuck with me to this day. It was very impressive and pretty scary for a 19 year old. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't did know have a question, I'm sorry. Iron lungs still in use. I'm sure they don't look like that if there are. Yeah, there's a few. Um, we posted on our social media, um, one of the last folks still actively using an iron lung. Um, we'll have to repost that so folks can, can watch. Uh, uh, we did have one other question. I'm sorry, Deb, I missed yours. Is distemper and diphtheria two different diseases? Say it again, please. Is distemper and diphtheria two different diseases? Um, well, it was called throat distemper. Um, and it was Ernest Caulfield who, who divided it up into scarlet fever in one area and diphtheria in the other. So it's, it, was, it was a general term that was used by both diseases when they didn't know that those were two diseases. So he went all through New England and, and studied gravestones and he could trace the track of how this was spread from town to town. By the time it got to Boston, what he was looking at, and some of the other North Shore towns, what he was looking at um, didn't fit with his later medical knowledge, and, and he discovered that it really was scarlet fever um, rather than diphtheria. But throat distemper is usually associated with, with um, 
what people now know as diphtheria. Thank you. Um, and I, Lori just posted here too that she recently listened to a podcast saying that there are a few people indeed who are still um, using iron lungs. Yeah. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to ask Laurel was that if you have any recommendations, I believe most folks are New England based. Um, what are your favorite cemeteries in Massachusetts and New England that you would recommend folks visit? Oh my goodness. I know um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I, yeah, it is. It's like saying, which is your favorite child? Um, I think, I don't know, Harvard, Massachusetts has a certain carver that's very interesting. Pepperell, um, certainly all the Boston, Lexington, Concord, there's just some rich things in there. Salem, of course. Um, in Plymouth County, almost anything, but you just have to see, a, you have to visit a lot to get uh, the most from that. Um, one of my favorite cemeteries is here in Cape Cod and it's not spectacular in any way or for any reason, except it's so secluded that you have to find it secretly. And it's up on a hill and it looks out over a pond and it's very close to the road, but you sort of forget that. And it's called the Sears Cemetery, one of several Sears cemeteries. But it's, it's sort of a secret place. Love it. Well, and we also I will think, I will think of at least 15 <laughs> cemeteries the minute I stop this. Ah, well, um, I, Deb, this is a question you can answer really quick because obviously both of us know this answer. Uh, many gravestones have a skull with wings. Uh, you want to talk about the death's head? <laughs> the symbolism of the death's head? Yeah. Well, first off, I think that a, a lot of us of the 21st century get very hung up on what we think all of this meant. Um, and, and, and are usually pretty right, but the people who carve these and the people who lived with these all the time, sometimes a circle was just a circle. And yet we get very carried away about assigning what, what it meant. Um, the skull with wings is, is a very universal death symbol. They believe that your, your, your soul, your breath, and your, therefore your soul leaves your body through your mouth. So, they, they believe that your essence, your soul is in your head or in your skull and the wings would take it away from earth, away from, from your physical body to whatever they believed was heaven or another place. So it's just a, it's a pretty graphic and very, very ancient symbol of death. Um, then there were the usuals, the winged hourglass time with wings, time flies away, time is gone. Uh, picks and shovels for digging graves, coffins. Well, I don't know. I was showing my, my ring for folks with the winged hourglass. I don't know if you can yes. see that there, mm -hmm. the winged hourglass I wear on me every day. Um, yeah, so, well, thank you. I think those are all the questions. So I just wanted a few last minute things. Um, one, you. another recommendation for a cemetery, uh, the Pine Cemetery at Tewksbury State Hospital, which the Public Health Museum is on the campus of. Um, we'll hope, we hope to be offering tours of the cemetery in, in the future. Um, and two other pieces, uh, please feel free to sign up for our trivia night this Friday. Um, it shall be a great, uh, great event and you'll actually get some um, some cheats <laughs> based on attending tonight's lecture and some of these things that Laurel discussed are in our trivia. So that is a bonus. Um, and the, I did just send out in the chat, there is a complete a survey. So if you wouldn't mind completing a survey, let us know how we are doing at, at the museum and our event planning, we would appreciate it. And last but not least, I of course wanted to thank the wonderful Laurel Gable for, attend, for doing this tonight. Um, I have heard this lecture many times and every time I learn more and I love it more and more. Um, and everyone says wonderful, thank you, um, how great it is. So we it, really appreciate you taking the time, Laurel. <laughs> no, first off, my children wouldn't recognize any of those things you're saying. Second, 
Thank you. We couldn't have done this without you because I am pretty illiterate for all this switching around. But we did it. You're wonderful. Thank you. We did it. Thank you all so Thanks, much Laura. for attending. And thank you so much, Laurel. And uh, we look forward to seeing some of you on Friday at Trivia Night. And I will just stay on just for a few minutes in case folks need to access um, the link. Susan, I saw your message. I'm going to send out a new um, link because I know it didn't work. So I will we'll do that. And I'll just hang out for a minute in case people want to grab that survey link. So thank you all again. And hope to see you Friday or one of our other week uh, events for Public Health Museum. Thank you so much. Good night.